We're still studying through 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 10 tonight, if you'd like to turn to that and follow along. A lot of good material in here, very relevant. I find uh, just daily the incredible amount of things that keep appearing before us in this day and time, and then looking back and seeing how the scriptures keep addressing that. It shouldn't be surprising when you consider how utterly incredible our God is that he would be able to write something that would be over 2,000 years old and yet it have application to this day and time. But it is always such an encouragement to look over what's happening. Chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, an interesting point to draw from this for our younger people especially. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So way before Apple had the eye cloud, Moses had the cloud. Just wanted you to be aware that it's there. Details, however, of what's being described here are more in reference to back in Exodus chapter 14. Shortly after the plagues had come upon Egypt and God's people were able to just march out and plunder all that was there, they come up upon the Red Sea. Now as they're getting up close to the Red Sea, Pharaoh changes his mind. He let them go, but now he's thinking maybe I shouldn't have. And so he puts his soldiers into full armor and heads out in chariots after them. And as he's pursuing them, they're, they're catching up. I mean, they're uh, maybe a million people plus as far as the Israelites are concerned. And, and they're moving at a slow pace. And I'm giving you a million as an you know, estimates. Could be two or three million. Who knows? But we do know that they've been there a long time. And there's a vast number. And men in chariots are moving a lot faster than a huge multitude of people with women and children. And, and carrying all kinds of plunder along with it. So they're coming up close Red Seas in front of the Israelites and they're figuring out or trying to think of what they're going to do. And God brings this huge fire and a cloud between them of darkness. So if you want to turn to Exodus, there's just that little comment here in verses 19 and 20. And it says, And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them and a pillar of cloud went out from before them and it stood between them. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, and it gave light to the night to the others, so that one did not come near the other all that night. So God puts his protective hand down there through a cloud. So actually it wasn't an eye cloud that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 10. But a cloud is there on the opposite side. However, it's a bright light in the middle of the night. Exactly what the Israelites need. While God then performs one of the greatest miracles, I guess one miracle compared to other. All of them are great. They're exceeding anything that man could ever do. And he parts the Red Sea. And with the wind through that, dries all the ground. And the Israelites have plenty of time. With God holding the Egyptians back to cross through that area. So what Paul's doing now in chapter 10 is he's giving us a beginning point here of, I'm going to talk a little bit about some Old Testament things. That may not relate to all of the people of Corinth as far as their history is concerned, but it does at least come into their understanding. I'm sure they're at least aware of some of the Old Testament uh, details here. And those of a Jewish background or within the Corinthian church have a great deal of appreciation for what's being discussed. And so Paul begins to discuss this. Now let's look at some of the things he alludes to and a couple applications we can get from this. So in verse 2, again, backtracking, he says, All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now they weren't immersed into the water, but they passed between the, the, the sides of the water that was on both sides as they came through dry ground. In a sense, they were down below the water and came up as they came up on the other side out of the water. Verse 3, then, all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. 
For they drank of that spiritual rock, notice capital R there, that followed them. That rock, and the reason it's capitalized, it says here, was Christ. May not have dawned on the Israelites during that time if there was Christ's involvement in this process. Now as he's dealing with some of these, he's going to come back and talk about some of the things that were problems for the Israelites that he'll talk about that deal with what happens here in verse 6. Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now usually we look at an example as something to follow. It's derived from the same word kind of describing the idea of a pattern. And so if you've got a pattern in a piece of wood and you cut it out, you can draw around it and, and reproduce exactly the same thing. Or if a woman's cutting a dress and she's got a pattern, she outlines around it and she cuts out the material so she can repeat what's happening there. Usually we think of it like that, but now we're talking about an example of a pattern not to follow. These became patterns to the intent we should not lust after, not do these things. And, and now he's going to go through and tell us some of these things. So all the people that are looking at this, if they're familiar with or at least fully in, uh, compared to it, or familiar with from the historical background as far as the Jewish people are concerned, he's going to draw some things from this. Number one in verse seven, and do not become idolaters as were some of them. So he's looking back and he's remembering what's happening. Don't do this. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Idolatry, strangely enough, was still an issue for the Israelites. In, in our day and time, in the culture that most of us have grown up with, it's hard for us to conceive of that. I was flipping through some old pictures that I have that, that go back ages of time. Back in the 70s. That's for some of you all way before your time. Others, it's like yesterday, wasn't it wasn't. But looking at some of these places I've been on some mission trips. And, and I remember at that time, even as I do today, looking at the fire walkers of Fiji. Walking across red hot coals as a part of their worship. They were worshiping their idols. Another one, two or three shots that I looked at were pictures of this, looked like a serpent's head, but it's a huge rock, maybe about 25 or 30 feet tall. And it came out of the side of the road. The Fijians swore that it was growing. There's a fenced area around it. There are candles that are set up there in front of it. The keeper of that whole rock, of course, makes quite a bit of profit for the people that come by because nobody can offer a sacrifice to this rock until they pay him their price, or buy the candles from him. We look at that and think, how on earth can people really think that that's going to be something beneficial? And yet, we do have issues of a different form of idolatry. Paul writes in one of his letters that covetousness is idolatry, wanting something over God. Matter of fact, if you look at it, anything that stands between us and God becomes first in our lives and thus becomes like a God to us above God. And, and so, very applicable because our country's plagued with materialism. Probably worse than it's ever been. I do see some of the younger generation looking at social things and, and being concerned maybe about some issues more than some of my generation. But I watch people of the generation before me that take out of their wallets and out of their savings and whatever and give an incredible amount of ways. But it's still an issue. We, we still concern ourselves, maybe to a great extent. Paul says, do not become idolaters as were some of them. Ultimately, it led them in a wrong direction and caused a lot of those people to become rebellious against God. Verse 8, Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and 
he puts a little footnote in here, in one day, and in one day, 23,000 fell. Because of one situation where immorality was involved in that. That example alone would tell me that God does not like his people involved in immorality. It also tells me when I'm looking at the quantity of people, 23,000 died, that that was a big issue back then. Even among all of those of God's people, you see. Well, we've talked about the issues of sexual immorality in the evening services here a few weeks back from chapter 5, particularly in 1 Corinthians. Be it said enough that it is an issue. It's something that affects all of us. We're aware because of the constant influence and the bombardment of things that we see on TV and on the internet and, and billboards and anywhere else. It's incredible. It really is. I just can't imagine having that kind of influence on me as a little boy growing up, of what our young men see, our young women, and what they're faced with in high school, college, and so forth. Sexual immorality is an issue. All right, number nine, verse nine. Nor let us tempt Christ, tempt Christ, that's what it says. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them were also tempted, or some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by the serpents. Now there was a situation where there were some serpents that God sent. In a period of time when they were rebellious and they were tempting God in another way here. I guess you could look at Exodus chapter 17 and you could see a more specific detail about that. But again, this same era of time of the children of Israel, as they're, they're coming out and, and as they're moving out of uh, the Egyptian bondage, they're, they're venturing across a desert land. And it'd be tough if there were 20 people marching along and they all shared one canteen of water. But could you imagine as you're looking around and as far as you can see, you're seeing people. And you're getting out into an area and you're beginning to be thirsty and you're wondering, well, wait a minute. <laughs> we don't have a lot of water. We carried a lot of things, but, you know, water's getting kind of scarce. I'm running low. How are we going to survive? So all the gold and all those other things that they carried with them, it's still there, but not going to do much good if they don't have something to survive with. Chapter 17 of Exodus. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel, this is when they're beginning to go out in the wilderness, set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord. Now that word wilderness of sin is not like sinfulness, disobeying God. It's the name of that area. And they camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and, and said give us water that we may drink so Moses said to them why do you contend with me why do you tempt the Lord even more so one thing is Moses another thing is the Lord and as you read on here it talks about the people thirsting and what is it described back in the first Corinthian 10 chapter did take place as God commanded in this case Moses to hit the rock and out of the rock came water. And over a million people, how many ever there were, less than a million, more than a million, more than two, every one of them had enough to drink, fill up whatever canteens or things that they might have, water jars, whatever it might be that they were carrying with them. God's point, and what Paul is connecting to here, is they aggravated God by not trusting him to take care of them. God's not going to lead you someplace where he's not going to take care of you. That doesn't mean that we're not going to face temptations. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have situations and trials and problems and struggles. And an abundance of those because Satan is right there and he's going to do all that he can. But what it means is God's not going to let you to get there and then leave you hanging and say, good luck, you're on your own. And so all that Paul's dealing with here is we go back to that. 1 Corinthians 10 chapter is, that was not a good example. 
So we're now looking at these examples of these people. There's one more mention here. Verse 10, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. They complained in chapter 16. They'd barely gotten out and then they realized, well, we don't have any food. God, did you not think about what you were doing? Yeah, he did. He had it figured out before they even figured out that they didn't have food. It's so important for us to understand as Christians that when we discover something that looks like some kind of struggle, something brand new on the scene, and we look at it and we think, how is God going to ever take care of this? That God saw it long before it ever appeared, has all kinds of solutions to it, and he's letting us go through it in order that we can be stronger. But we have to realize in this process, as Paul's talking about here, that there is a challenge for that. Don't be like the other people. Now, stop and think sometimes. Why does God put all these things in here? Why does he show to us some of the bad things about the people of Israel? He could have just totally forgotten that part. I mean, it happened. And many other things did happen that aren't written in here. Probably a lot of other times they complained or other times they did good. But God picks out and puts in these things so we can see examples of good and examples of bad. And then how God deals with that so we can understand. God says, this really isn't pleasing. This actually is sinful. And he's going through this. And in amongst the things of sexual immorality, now false things about complaining or attempting Christ and then complaining. We complain about at least I hear that. We call them protest in our country. I have the right to protest. And so you have a lot of times people on one side of the road protesting, and the other people protesting the protesters. And there's all kinds of things happening. But it's not encouraging at all. And as we're dealing with all of this, this concept of protesting and complaining, when God is setting things in motion for us as a church, is not healthy because we're disregarding what God is up to and complaining to Him ultimately. And that's why the children of Israel were reprimanded for that. Now verse 11, it says then, as you're looking at this, that all these things happened to them as examples and they were written down. See, some of them weren't, but these were. These were written down for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now, here's the principle that's coming out, out of all the things that are happening here. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Now, back up and think about who he's talking to right now, first of all. He's talking to what seems to be one of the most spiritual churches around, or at least Corinth would think of themselves this way. They had the spiritual gifts, miraculous gifts. No, they don't exist today, miraculous gifts. Don't, not like what was going on here. Gifts of healing, gifts of, of tongues, actually speaking in different languages without having learned them. We learn them today and then can do it, but they didn't need that. God was giving them gifts of healing and all kinds of things. And so these are all taking place in Corinth in abundance. And so they think, well, look at all the things we can do. Therefore, we are spiritual. And if you'll remember back a few weeks ago, God was really setting them straight through the pens of Paul as he says, I'm treating you like babes in Christ, because that's really where you're at, spiritually speaking. And so now he's talking to these people who think they're something strong. Matter of fact, I wrote at the top of my sermon the title of it. It comes from a 60s or 70s song. It says, Mr. Big Stuff, who do you think you are? Maybe you heard it, maybe you haven't. But this is what God's saying to the church of Corinth. Okay, you... You big, strong, spiritual people. You're really not there at all. And then he gives us this principle. Now, he's talking to spiritual people. And he's dealing with people who would look at themselves as the leaders, the superior people of all of these. And he says, now, I want you to be careful. Because idolatry could be a problem. Tempting Christ could be a problem. Complaining 
like you're putting that up ahead like I'm going to set something straight so I'm going to complain. It's, it's not good because it doesn't edify the church. And he, and he lists a variety of different things to these people who think they've got it together. And then he says at the bottom of all that, let him who thinks he stands, that he's superior spiritually, take heed lest he fall. Not only was it bad for the people, you see, in the, in the sense that it was leading other people to do things that they ought not to be doing, but it was bad for the individual that was doing it because they are so close to falling off the edge, they don't even see it. And this is what God's saying to them. So they had a double dilemma here as far as spiritual growth is concerned. They weren't there. And they had the potential of actually falling off the cliff. An admonition for all the people that think they've got it together. The, the, the Sunday night strong crew, and we're here, to the preachers who think they've got it together. Or the people that know all the scriptures, or, or whoever it might be. Just a reminder of how good Satan is in getting any of us. And instead of reflecting and looking at the other people of how they're not, just think about ourselves. Let him who thinks he stands, this is reflective. Let him take heed, lest he fall, you see. So it becomes very personal for us. So rather than look at that scripture and thinking, oh, that's a good one for us, turn it around and say, that's a good one for me. That's where I ought to be right now, serving and looking at. All these others we think need it. And God says, the people really that are liable to fall are the ones that don't think they will. We have in our assembly tonight, I noticed uh, coming in here, uh, a few people that are using walkers. And, and they use them as in any setting because they don't want to fall. Now, besides all that, they have them because the doctor said, you're going to use a walker. I know a lot of other people that the doctors have said, you need to use a walker. They said, no thanks, I'll need it. You've seen them probably around. They're struggling. And occasionally they do fall over a house and they say, what happened? Well, I, the walker was over here and I thought I could make it. To, and they just thought they could make it. Now, here's the spiritual application of that little setting here. Is We're like that. We never really realize we're in a moment until the, the walker's over here and I need it and it's over there. Spiritually speaking, we all need walkers so we don't fall. Now I can go to Isaiah 40 and talk about you know, the God raising us up on eagle's wings and running with And yes, that's definitely true. No, no, don't take that out. But in the whole scheme of things, any solid, strong Christian, however it is, needs to be aware there's the potential to fall. Jeremiah has a very classical verse that ties in with this in chapter 10 of his lengthy book. As he's writing in verse 23, he says, Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. He knows how to walk, but he's not the one to be responsible about where he walks, not to give direction in his steps. Now let's look here for a different type. Rather than people who use the walker, let's talk about children, child development. All of us have seen and been involved one way or another, whether you have kids or not, with some little bitty types that are just teetering and just barely learning to, to grab that balance. And that's an exciting moment. And you're, I've seen a hundred times or a thousand times, you know, People are excited about that child learning to make that step. And you get in front, you stoop down, and, and you're holding your hands out in front of them and saying, come on, come on. You're just maybe a few inches away from their hands, but you're coaching them to walk towards you. 
and they're, they're, they're looking at it and analyzing it and trying to figure out if they can make that step, and eventually they do. And you're so excited, and, and after a little bit of time, you'll back up and you'll give a little bit more distance. Okay, come on, and you coach him a little more. And after a little while, he's doing real good. Matter of fact, he's doing so great that you don't have to stand in front. And at that point, the child says, I can walk. And at that point, you need watching. Because he's going to go somewhere else. Now you get in front of him and say, come on, come on. No thanks, I've gone. Aren't they? Aren't, didn't we? Probably. And this is exactly what Jeremiah is saying. About the time you think you know how to walk, it's time to realize that you don't know how to direct your steps. I remember my oldest tackling the youngest as the little one was learning to walk. And we looked up and there she was going toward the stairs and the old one ran and, and nearly both of them fell down the steps. Well, she was going to keep her from going down there. But the tragedy of bouncing down those old wooden steps was pretty serious. Spiritually speaking, God looks at us and he's trying to get us to realize we've got a direction to go. But it's not in us to figure it out. This whole idea of letting God lead is so valuable, so important. We start out every Sunday morning and Sunday evening with scripture readings. And sometimes the scripture reading, as was tonight, is directed toward the reading of how important scripture is in itself. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, ought to tell us something about how important it is for us to remember that it's God's word that's cleaning us, directing us, guiding us, that it's our statutes, that we can't do it ourselves. So, Mr. Big Stuff, be careful who you are. Let God direct. Not a man who walks to direct his own steps. Let him who thinks he walks take heed. Satan's good. Be careful. God love you. God bless you. And tonight, if you need to respond to the gospel, we sing a song to encourage you. While we stand, please come.